Hi, this is Michael Altos. We are talking about antimicrobial drugs today, and this is recording part one. First, a brief overview about the principles of antimicrobial therapy. Normally, when we give drugs for antibiotics in the operating room, we're trying to prevent a surgical site infection, as well as treating any already known or suspected infection that may be present. We have to be aware of any toxic or allergic reactions that can occur when we give antimicrobial drugs. We can divide antibiotics into broad categories. For example, we can talk about bacteriostatic versus bactericidal. Bacteriostatic drugs stop bacteria from forming and reproducing. They disrupt either protein formation or DNA synthesis to prevent reproduction. Then there are bactericidal drugs, which actually kill the existing bacteria. And as you can imagine, these would be a better choice for perioperative antibiotics to really take out existing bacteria instead of just preventing growth of future bacteria. They're also better for patients who are critically ill or immunocompromised. These drugs usually disrupt the cell wall or the cell membrane, although they can also disrupt protein or DNA formation, and that would prevent generation of the proteins necessary for cell survival. We can also classify these drugs as narrow or broad spectrum. Narrow spectrum drugs tend to be effective only against specific bacteria of concern, whereas broad spectrum antibiotics are effective against lots of different kinds of bacteria. Uh, that sounds like a better approach, but some of the side effects include effects on some of the normal bacteria that live in our bodies, and upsetting that balance may be detrimental to the patient. When we dose antibiotics, we want to achieve what's called an MIC, a minimum inhibitory concentration. It's the minimum serum concentration that you need in order to be effective against the bacteria you're trying to eradicate. So when you underdose antibiotics, either with low dosing or not frequent enough dosing, you can promote bacterial resistance. On the other hand, patients who have hepatic or renal dysfunction may benefit from underdosing in order to achieve the proper serum concentration. A very quick review of the principles of antimicrobial therapy. It's important that you remember what a gram stain is. It's a violet dye that identifies properties of the cell wall, and there's two kinds of bacteria out there, gram-positive bacteria and gram-negative. Gram-positive bacteria have, and examples of them include the bacillus, the clostridium, Enterococcus, Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, these bacteria have a thick peptidoglycan layer, but they don't have an outer membrane. They tend to be more susceptible to antibiotics and antibodies, and often they're not pathogenic, they just normally live in the body. So here we see a picture of a gram-positive cell wall. There's your phospholipid bilayer, and then here is your large cell wall. On the other hand, we have gram-negative bacteria. Many, many kinds, Campylobacter, Chlamydia, Enterobacter, E. coli, Klebsiella, Neisseria, Pseudomonas, Salmonella. These bacteria have an impermeable cell wall due to an outer membrane. These tend to be more resistant to antibiotics and antibodies and tend to be more pathogenic and only exist when something is wrong. So here you see their phospholipid bilayer, a very small cell wall, and then another outer membrane. We can also divide bacteria into aerobes versus anaerobes. Aerobes are bacteria that require oxygen to survive. In the anaerobes, we have facultative anaerobes, which could grow with or without oxygen, and then obligate anaerobes, which actually can only grow without oxygen. So aerobes would be like bacillus or pseudomonas. The facultative anaerobes are often found in your skin or your nares, in your um, oropharynx, sinuses, and GI tract and they can be gram-positive or gram-negative. And then the obligate anaerobes, or the microaerophiles, are often found in the GI tract and the genitalia. Again, they can be gram-positive or gram-negative. When we talk about adverse reactions to antibiotics, we're first concerned with allergy. And people can be allergic to any drug, but we especially talk about allergy to beta-lactams and their derivatives. Patients can have a true immune-mediated reaction, which would lead to rash, pruritus, bronchospasm, or even anaphylaxis. And we just need to remember that in that case, even the tiniest test dose 
is likely to trigger a full-blown immune-mediated allergic reaction. Patients can also have non-immune-mediated histamine release. Certain drugs just cause histamine to be released and it's in a dose-dependent fashion or a rate-dependent fashion. And they can still get rash or itching, bronchospasm, flushing. It can be just as severe as an immune-mediated reaction, but it's dose or rate-dependent. Now, they used to call this an anaphylactoid reaction. That's not really a current term anymore. It, rather, they would call it a non-immune-mediated mediated anaphylactic reaction. And a classic example of that is vancomycin, where patients get red man syndrome that we'll talk about shortly, and it's dependent on how quickly you administer the drug. And then there are other non-histamine-related adverse reactions, fever, phlebitis, electrolyte disturbances, neuromuscular blockade, and so on. Patients can have GI upset. That's especially true with erythromycin or tetracyclines, which affect GI motility. But in general, patients can have nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. Uh, they can also have overgrowth of the normal flora in their GI tract as you kill some of the flora with your antibiotic. They can also get candidal infections or very particularly Clostridium difficile infections. And C. diff is a big problem in the hospital, and especially in patients who are receiving antimicrobial therapy. And then organs can be affected by antibiotics, including the ears, the kidneys, and the developing fetus. You can also have drug interactions between antibiotics and other drugs. There are antibiotics that can affect the cytochrome P450 system or that can affect protein binding. There was a project called SKIP, the Surgical Care Improvement Project. It was retired in 2015, but these guidelines still persist in a lot of common OR practice. One of the components of SKIP was surgical antimicrobial prophylaxis, the idea of giving perioperative antibiotics. They wanted to standardize delivery of an antibiotic before incision in order to have the lowest rate of surgical site infection, SSI. We understood that infection rates would go up if antibiotics were given way too early or if they were given after incision. The goal is to give narrow-spectrum antibiotics that target the organisms most likely to be encountered during the operation, and then maintain adequate antibiotic levels in tissue the entire time the wound is open in the OR. And for most operations, the standard of care was to give an IV antibiotic prior to incision. The guideline was to administer the correct antibiotic within one hour prior to surgical incision, with appropriate dosing based on weight and renal function, and then redosing on an appropriate schedule which may be more frequent dosing if there's major blood loss. We know that giving antibiotics moments before incision is probably not enough time, so even though one second before is within an hour, we probably need more than five minutes to achieve adequate antibiotic levels in tissues. What if it's been more than 60 minutes? Well, back when we had the guidelines, this was uh, considered a violation. But in fact, just because it's been more than 60 minutes prior to incision doesn't mean that you necessarily require redosing, and you should check with the local guidelines at your institution to see if antibiotics need to be redosed if they ended up being given more than 60 minutes before incision. Remember, the goal is to prevent wound infection, which is caused by the normal flora of the skin and the GI or the GU tract where the surgery is taking place. Also, some elective uh, clean surgical procedures may not require antibiotics. Even if there's a skin incision, we don't always have to give antibiotics for every type of surgical procedure. This is just an example of some skip guidelines showing different kinds of surgeries and what the preferred antibiotic would be, as well as some alternatives if the patient has a beta-lactam allergy or if the patient has a known history of methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, MRSA. We'll stop there. Please contact me with any questions and we'll continue in the next recording.